Um, my name is Kira Nickel. I'm the coordinator of the Design Fabrication Zone here at Ryerson. Uh, thank you for coming to our forum this evening with the Toronto Society of Architects. Um, at this point, I'd like to welcome Maria Denegri, uh, the chair of the Toronto Society of Architects, to the stage. Okay, um, I'm just here to give a very brief um, introduction um, to what the TSA is. Um, there are many of you that are very familiar with the TSA, Toronto Society of Architects. We are a non-profit organization of volunteers, architects, urban planners, students, members of the public. Um, and we are primarily an advocacy group for architecture um, in the city. Uh, this is our second forum of the year, and we are very happy to be partnering with the Design Fabrication Zone and um, B3D um, to um, put together this event tonight. I would like at this point to uh, simply introduce Tom Vesai, who's the Managing Director of the Design Fabrication Zone, and he will be moderator for the evening. He will introduce the speakers, um, give a brief presentation. Each of the speakers will um, present their view on the topic, and then we will have a moderated discussion, and there will be plenty of opportunities for you to ask questions. Okay, so um, thank you for coming, making the event a success, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Bestai. Um, so I'm the managing director of the Design Fabrication Zone. Uh, and we're very pleased to partner this evening with um, the Toronto Society of Architects to bring you this evening's forum, New Design and Technology Synergies. Sponsor sponsoring this event, um, the, the TSA has a, has a sponsor, LRI. Uh, you can see their logo down at the bottom of the screen there. As well, um, uh, on behalf of Ryerson, the B3D Group, which is a branch of the Ryerson um, uh, Research and Innovation Office, OVPRI, are um, collaborators with this evening's events. Um, just as a note on that front, um, there's a very brief questionnaire that B3D has provided and they would love to have as many of the audience members as are able to fill it out, um, fill it out. Um, my colleague Duncan is around the entrance over there and he has the forms over there and there's some pens. I know some of you have, fi have filled it out. It would be really appreciate it if you would uh, uh, take the time to fill out their form. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> tonight's forum, the full title, um, New Design and Technology Synergies, Formations and Outlets for Design, Fabrication and Prototyping in Toronto. The panel will explore how <clears throat> distributive technologies, um, dis sorry, disruptive technologies um, present new pathways and methods to design and production. So. Our panelists this evening are here assembled. So I'm one of the panelists and the moderator, Tom Vesai, Ren Scott, Mark Sishi, and Manya Mibodi. So the forum format will be as follows. Um, each of us will make a short presentation um, and about 10 or 15 minutes with slides. Um, so the, the order will be myself, then Ren, Mark, and then Manya. Um, so then after that, we'll do a moderated discussion amongst the four of us. So maybe around 20 minutes where we will discuss some of the topics of the forum. So I've, I'm going to just give you these topics now just as a kind of primer and we'll get back to these questions uh, once we've done our presentations. Um, so the questions that we're going to be posing are, in the context of this topic, what are these new methods of design and production that we're talking about, these technology-enabled method, methodologies for design and for fabrication? Who are the new practitioners, and what is their relationship to legacy designers, engineers, and associations? That being, who, what, who are the new practitioners in, in these new mod modalities of work? Next question will be, what are the universities doing to engage these changes in design and production? And finally, what are the spaces and networks in the city that are emerging um, within this evolving context? So after this portion, we will open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so, and to get things started then, I am going to just do a quick bio and introduction of each of our panelists, okay? Um, you're going to be hearing too much from me this evening. I'm going to do my own bio first. Uh, here we go. So, Tom Bestai, moderator, managing director of the Design Fabrication Zone. So, I hold a BA from the U University of Alberta and a Bachelor of Architecture from UBC and MARC from UCLA. 
Uh, in 2013, I completed a cycle of graduate research at the University of Michigan in design technology and material systems. So I'm re representing here the design fabrication zone, and I just wanted to give you a very brief statement of what the DF said is. Uh, the design fabrication zone at Ryerson University is an institutionally affiliated incubator that pursues and supports innovation in design and fabrication. We maintain expertise in the current methods and workflows in design and fabrication through the use of state-of-the-art technology. Um, we cultivate and support experimental design fabrication projects, work, and design-based entrepreneurial ventures across a kind of spectrum of students to um, various types of ventures. Um, so it's not just students, but we're combining our efforts to help students as well as other, other startups and practitioners. Okay, so in addition to my role at, at the DFZ, I'm a principal for technology and design at, D, at Denegri Besai Studio. Uh, we were recently awarded an OAA award for best emerging practice. Um, I've taught architectural design uh, for many years um, at University of Toronto, University of Waterloo, Carleton, and Ryerson. Uh, my experimental design work and research has been widely presented and exhibited and has been published in both popular and peer-reviewed journals. Okay. Um, the next panelist, um, Ren Scott, she's a user experience expert and strategic innovator, and she's the founder and chief designer at Daily Goods Design Labs. Ren holds an MA in Interaction Design from the Royal College of Art in London. She's founder of Daily Goods Design Labs. A, a design leader and prolific inventor, Ren has, pa has a passion for creating innovative user experiences and forward-thinking product designs. With over 20 years of experience at companies such as IBM and BlackBerry, in leadership roles within user experience design research, consumer insights and strategic innovation, Ren has helped design best-in-class products and experiences. Her hands-on approach and point of view are, as, a, as a designer is radically different from the most. For any project, she always starts with why create something in the first place and uses a co-creative co design methodology and best practices based on insights gained from female consumers. Right, Ren's experience and observations have been that there is a lack of female design lead, leaders and designers in the tech and design fields. Instead of just leading by example, Ren strives to empower other women to make, create and innovate in the field of design, technology, and fashion by sharing her insights, skills, and knowledge through daily goods design labs, uh, pop-ups, and educa educational events and series. Um, I know that Ren has, has run a lot of different hackathons and design events through Ryerson University. She's not on her bio, but she's currently also teaching uh, industrial design uh, and innovation at OCAD University. So please join me in welcoming Ren Scott. Ren? Um, next is Mark Sishi. Mark is the Director of Computation and Research for Dialog, the architecture firm Dialog. Mark holds a Master of Architecture degree from University of Waterloo with a Bachelor of Envir Environmental Studies from Waterloo as well. At Dialog, Mark develops, designs, he develops and designs building solutions for the architectural, fabrication, spatial geometry, and technology industries. He works on projects locally and internationally, creates research and training platforms for the firm. Before joining Dialog, Mark was founder and principal of Design at Mill, Inc., a design and fabrication consultancy specializing in developing emergent and advanced technological solutions. Mark has taught studios and has conducted computer work computation workshops at many universities and design schools, uh, including Ryerson, Waterloo, MIT, the AA, and Columbia University. He has many publications in this area, including a recently co-authored paper entitled Interactive Design Galleries, a general approach to interacting with design alternatives. That's from 2016. Please join me in uh, welcoming Mark Sishi. <clears throat> um, finally, um, Mania Mebodi. She's a senior researcher in computation and design fabrication at the, with the um, digital building technologies team at ETH in Zurich. Mania is an architect active in practice, research, and education. She holds a PhD from KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. She's a senior researcher in computation and digital fabrication at the, at the Di Digital Building Technologies, or, or DBT, team with the ETH in Zurich. She's a founding partner of the architectural practice Mon Monia. Monia's research and practice are focused on integral computation and materialization approaches to design. She has taught and lectured in architecture and computational geometry at various universities since 2009, including KTH and Lulea University of Technology in Sweden. 
Manya has been a guest critic with many universities, including the U of T, Architectural Association, the Bartlett, ETH, UCLA, and the list continues. Please join me in welcoming Manya Mebodi. I'm just going to grab a sip of water, and I'm going to switch the slides around, and I'm going to get started on the presentation. So I'm going to make a first of the four uh, presentations of some positioning and work in the context of <coughs> uh, computation, design, and the spaces and production of these involving these new technologies. Okay, um, so just keep in the back of your minds our topic, new design and technology synergies, formations and outlets for design, fabrication, and prototyping here in Toronto. Um, the presentation I'm going to give you is, it sets up a kind of overview of some of these questions around process and practices as well as the spaces, let's say, for design and fabrication. So I'll very briefly show you three ideal projects. Then I'll, I'll give you a couple of principles along the lines of technology and workflow when you're engaging in computational design and digital fabrication. So from the computer through to physical kind of outputs, material systems. And then finally, um, I will show you some images and slides to discuss the kind of ecosystem around which these practices can take place, the physical spaces for design and fabrication. So, these are just some principles around ideal projects that I think are important to try to keep in mind. It'll be, the, I'm going to go this very, through this very quickly, but just to say, geometry, order, and meaning. Many of you that are architects would recognize this as a principle from many years, for many years in architecture. Local response with minimum energy. Performance versus behavior, which would be like an engineering approach versus, let's say, an architectural approach. Whereas engineers are very interested in specific measures of performance, architects are often interested in a kind of behavioral um, environment or an environment of effects. So the thing they're searching for through computation and material systems may not necessarily be manifest in their mind as they're working. So it's more of an experimental approach. Redundancy, where we are developing increasingly systems that complement one aspect complements another. Um, um, and then hybrid or interactive um, systems systems that can, that can evolve depending on um, the, the user group um, and that take advantage inventively of different kinds of um, systems. So some of you rec will recognize these projects. I'll go through them very briefly. These are from at the MIT Media Lab. One is a kind of a gradient 3D print by Neri Oxman. The other is the Silk Pavilion by um, graduate students and, and researchers at the, at the MIT Media Lab. In both of these cases, there's a kind of combination of ideas between the material formations that are being looked at and, and computation. Um, another couple of examples, um, the arabesque wall by Benjamin Dillenberger um, that was exhibited here in Toronto uh, about a year and a half ago. Ben was a faculty at the University of Toronto here, and he's now working in Manya's group in ETH Zurich. Um, the development of this very organic, kind of large-scale artifact through computation and then through a kind of a digital fabrication process is very, is very exciting and interesting and has a kind of quality of the, of the handmade that is reminiscent of some sort of, of the Rococo as it kind of might meet something from the future. Uh, and then another pavilion that really expresses a kind of responsiveness in its environment, the UK pavilion from Shanghai of Heatherwick Studio. All these are examples of projects that have a kind of interesting formation and presence within, this, within spaces uh, that are coming out of this kind of combined um, set of principles. This is a project from my own studio, from Denegri Besai Studio. Again, it's a, it's, a, it's a very lightweight structure that leverages a kind of hybrid material system to produce a kind of lightweight pavilion. So we have 3D printed elements and then bending active elements in combination to produce a very lightweight structure. Um, and finally, um, the use of some of the fabrication tools, when one starts to consider the feedback from these devices and tools, there's a, a range of interaction characteristics that can be of great interest. So these are examples of, let's say, interaction design that's governed by digital fabrication equipment. So we have, th these are examples from Bot and Dolly, and another example is just a straight up projection mapping project, but stepping outside of, let's say, architecture and design through to kind of interaction design and environment design where these environments can be um, willfully kind of managed to produce various kinds of real-time effects. 
Okay, very briefly, some of the kind of workflows that start to take place when you factor in not just design, but also des fabrication through computation. Material testing, computation, machine feedback. Old school, Fry Auto, testing materials before they were uh, in, in both in, in their primary state as well as through kind of test bed models that then led to larger edification. This is a, a slide from the University of Michigan. It's a group of students that are working across a kind of a digital simulation that's on your left and a kind of um, real world manifestation of that through physical testing on the right. A uh, very well-known recent project from the, the ICD in Stuttgart, and what this is showing is a kind of set of relationships between machines and modular elements through, that's governed by a kind of computation environment. So there's this close alliance between the computation environment and the, and the, and the devices that are making the modules. There's all the feedback from the making is going into the kind of final design of the, of the project. Very sophisticated work that's involving many researchers across architecture and engineering. And finally, this is an example of, um, uh, this is a project from Martin Rees of Front Inc. that really looks at a kind of next generation networked approach to computational design where many, many uh, designers are working through, kind of, through Grasshopper, which is a plug-in for Rhino to develop uh, the detailing for this very complex geometry project. So it's not so much a comment about the architecture itself, but rather it, interest in the methods that it's being created. So with all these things in mind, what are some of the kind of ecosystems or spaces that are being um, developed and in what way are those spaces being developed and for what reason? So how do we start to catch some of these ideas and sort of try to build um, positive spaces that can start to take advantage of these new techniques and technologies around computation and fabrication if we're really interested in making actual things? At the design fabrication zone, we're in a kind of a, a we're, we're constantly in play here at Ryerson trying to kind of develop the right kinds of spaces for this work. You're seeing, you're sitting in a space that was, is really the kind of one of the, the best achievements of the university so far. It's this very kind of exciting uh, environment that we're in. Um, so there's definitely a kind of a great attitude here at Ryerson, but we are very much trying to de deliver, to discuss and deliver what the, the really the important spaces for fabrication are uh, through the university. So this is an example. We, we were kind of um, brainstorming about what the ideal space for a fabrication lab would be. And it starts, you know, it's pretty unformed. Those of you that are actual architects, like, well, that's not a plan. That is just a really vague diagram. <laughs> and then we started looking at examples of the different kinds of spaces. So that's a huge discussion, but we're kind of on the trail. Another thing to think about within this ecosystem is the kind of maker movement. This is from, um, this slide is from the book by James Stevens called Digital Vernacular. He's very interested in, as many are, in the kind of maker movement of kind of digging into machines like, 3D printers and laser cutters and kind of modifying those machines and then kind of getting weirder outputs. This kind of hands-on attitude towards machines and learning how they work, as daunting as it can be for, for professionals in practice, I think is absolutely key in order to kind of understand um, what these things are for and how they might work and how they will eventually maybe influence the work of these bigger practices. Uh, briefly, Ryerson's building a kind of a non- um, a non-denominational fabrication lab, which is a kind of a new thing. Mostly labs like this, which has you know, fairly sophisticated technology in it, are, are run through a particular faculty or department, like an architecture school. They're bringing on stream a kind of open lab that has very sophisticated equipment. So um, we're, we'll have seven axis robots, we'll have a suite of smaller robots, uh, various CNC machines, et cetera, all in the context of more conventional or traditional uh, making spaces. Um, and thrown into the mix is a kind of a teaching area. And so this thing is going to be, it'll, again, it's, it's still a bit of a vision, but the idea is that it's shared across faculties and departments, particularly from engineering here at Ryerson through to the faculty of communications and the zones, which are these technology interested incubators where will also have good access to this space. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that kind of plays out. Um, this is what it starts to look like when you have teaching and learning happening around these machines in these environments. Um, the left is a slide from University of Michigan where there was a kind of a robotics workshop and on the right, James Stevens came in, he brings in a, a, this miniature CNC machine in a suitcase and he unfolds it in a, in, a, in a kind of working space. 
And then beyond that, the spaces, and this isn't maybe the best slide to show this, this is something from my practice, but it, or, or of, of experimentation kind of, they leave the lab and they kind of end up out on the site. So this is students working on a kind of real world project. Once it's been prototyped, et cetera, in a kind of a, a fabrication lab, it's out in the city getting kind of made. Um, and finally, one of the things that we're very burdened to deal with, but that's sort of exciting as well, is from the point of view of the university, we're not only trying to create these spaces that are functional, but we're constantly trying to kind of put them on display so the broader community can sort of see what it looks like to do digital fabrication. Many, many people will come up to you and say, oh, is that a th did you 3D print that? And, and it's like a, a sofa. And you're like, well, actually, there's better ways to make a sofa than 3D printing it. But, you know, but the point is, is that it's this kind of ongoing discussion where if these things become more visible, you can get people to be more a little bit. You're, you're educating the, 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 the culture as you go. So between that and kind of this, this sort of displaying of these spaces and to the, to the sort of development of performance is, uh, I think, really important. Thank you very much. I will pass the mic on to Ren. So I'm, I'm Ren Scott. Thank you, Tom, for what seemed like too long of an introduction earlier. Um, I am the uh, founder of a design collective of women that make, create, and innovate in the field of fashion, design, and technology. And our interests are within the world of Internet of Things and the future of wearable tech. And we focus specifically on designing for women, though I do work as a design consultant and not all of my clients are women, but we do um, use sort of key insights and design principles that have been gained over the last um, three years now from, the, uh, from research and interviews and ethnographic studies for, for women. So why design for women? Anyone have some ideas? Shout it out. <laughs> not in this room, but what's that? Why not? Exactly. Why not? So many, um, in the, in, certainly my, my background has been in the world of user experience, uh, interaction design, but working at high tech firms such as startups that got bought by IBM and BlackBerry. So, you know, designed with a lot of uh, male colleagues and, you know, specifically uh, wearables and devices, typically more masculine in nature. So as time has progressed, um, you know, looking at that female focused side. So a huge demographic, women buy for themselves. They buy for their, when they, ha or buy for their partners, when they get married, buy for husbands. As they have children, they of course buy for them. As they age, they buy for their grandchildren as well. So huge consumer um, power, but also uh, multi-generational. Uh, aspect as well, and we use at um, or I use for my for my company and design collective a, what we call a co-creation methodology. If people aren't familiar with that term, what it means is that we um, interview the people that we're designing for. They're engaged in our design process, and we also interview uh, what we would consider industry experts. In this case, we were looking at um, designing things that women wear and carry. So we also interview um, social bloggers such as Megan, who's known as the fashion savage on the left, and Amanda Costco. For those people that are kind of in the world of fashion tech, you likely would have seen or met um, Amanda before. So specifically in terms of, you know, designing or designing for women, we also find that women typically aren't as well seen in the worlds of, um, maybe you can say obvious in this room as well, not as many female architects, not as female designers, industrial designers, people in tech. So we also look to share our insights as we design and, and look to empower more women to get into the field as well. And by involving the people that you are designing for, that in the, the end result is that the products will be more appropriate for them. So daily goods design labs, I'm sure people have seen similar types of processes as these, but we look at, you know, first beginning, what is it that we're designing? Um, we think of, you know, what can we design now versus in the future, so what's next? So those would be kind of formed with what if statements. So what if we created something like this? What would happen? How does that change expectations? And thinking of those things that change expectations, then we can see kind of what, what is wow, what's delightful or interesting. These are probably words that you've heard that you kind of look for in those designs. But you know, we always get, of course, depending on what we're creating, um, what will work and what you know, ultimately will help us bring value. And value in many cases is, of course, has dollar signs attached to it. So we use um, design thinking methodology. Who would say within their practice they're using design thinking? 
Anybody? It's kind of a term, kind of a buzzword now. Um, we like to think of it as kind of this mindset for design as well. It's, I mean, it's a methodology, it's a process, it's a way of thinking of, you know, how to imagine our, our potential future. We do that again by listening. You know, first we're inspired, we begin after listening to what people want, um, what are their goals and motivations, try to discover what we'd say are their unmet needs, so things that they might not know that they want yet until we kind of show them some examples. We ideate, we analyze and think, and from there we start to do our prototypes and experimentation. We always um, think of, so we're not developing an app or a device, a wearable or a product, but we're actually looking at the experience that, we're, that we want to create. And first we start with thinking of, you know, the people we're designing for. I expect this is probably common practice for many of you. So the people you're designing for, where are they, what are they doing, the types of activities that they will do within the spaces, the environments that we're creating for. Another framework, another way of looking, of course, at the sort of design thinking process is starting with empathy. So the people, again, that you're designing for, you first understand, understand them. Um, you then look to ideate and um, specifically more in this session, we're talking more about prototyping. So this is the exploration stage, of course, followed by then, you know, reiterating, testing, seeing what type of material um, we might use before we then implement some solutions. So I thought I'd give you a few, um, just some examples in terms of, you know, things that I'm certainly working on. Um, wearables, Internet of Things, another term that we're using more often, the Internet of Me. Um, wearables, this is more of probably what the typical wearables look like. Who has a wearable? Oh, a few people. Look at that. Actually, this is a bigger uh, audience than most. Unexpected people to interview after. So simply put, uh, wearable is something that you might wear on an everyday basis, incorporates technology. Uh, these ones would be ones likely that you've seen, so it might take the form of augmented reality glasses, maybe even a personal health monitor in the form of a bracelet. I can now see a few people that do have those. Now I know architects are more likely to have wearables than even industrial designers. That's pretty cool. Um, we're seeing more examples such as the one on the right where it's looking at, you know, not just a, a gadget or something that you might wear, but something that's integrated right onto the skin. So lots of different types of materials, plastics and so on, that are becoming more of a, a skin attachment. Um, but the wearables, where do they sit in the larger scheme of those things that incorporate technology? So that this was a nice quote. So most of my career, technology has been something that you hold in your hand such as a device such as this, something you put in your pocket or something that sits on your desk, and that idea is about to be transformed. So wearables fit into the, um, well, fit into the larger theme of Internet of Things, and very curious, and I'd love to chat with people more at the end of the session in terms of where your thoughts are with this. But, you know, we have a wearable, so something that you wear on an everyday basis. How can it connect with those other objects around you, specifically, um, you know, buildings within spaces and so on for either home, uh, work, and entertainment. Uh, an interesting one, this is actually something that you can now see at Home Depot next time you go, so it's not a uh, far future anymore, though it was when I first put this slide together, and it's a face recognition camera that actually detects the difference between a face and, an, face and an intruder, so, you know, this is one example of, you know, something that's really useful you can have in your home, especially for those people that have kids no longer, will they lose keys, <laughs> can show up their door, be show up at the door, be recognized, come into the house easily and seamlessly, and, you know, from their perspective, it's an easy way of interacting. They can be, you know, recognized. You could have something sent as an alert to your phone. So it helps empower the kids while at the same time allows the parents to feel that they know where their children are. Um, so these sensors, why and why, why the Internet th of Things now? Sensors are becoming smaller, cheaper, more easily to integrate into those things around you. A term... Um, <coughs> that I wanted to share. You may or may not have heard this, but a lot of um, you know, trend analysts are referring to this idea of the physical and the digital being combined as fidgetal. I don't know if that's an interesting word or not, but kind of a fun one in terms of this idea that you know, probably three to five years ago, we may look at this experience as something new. We might not have known how to interact, but more and more in stores and retail spaces in particular, we're seeing that we can you know, interact with things in a digital space while at the same time shopping and browsing and yet not seeing, seeing those two things as different. 
lastly, in terms of Internet of Things, we're starting to see sensors more integrated into, um, you know, wearables, but more clothing. So this is a wearable as well. has a lot of, um, you know, sophisticated technology that goes into fabric and smart materials. But Avery Dennison has... Um, it's talking about, you know, clothing being the new internet of everything and incorporating what, you know, used to be in the Avery label, um, just simple labels, sensors, where you can attach a some kind of digital knowledge to all these things. So, you know, connecting your clothing, no longer will you, you know, lose, um, you know, glasses or, you know, some of these things that are just commonly misplaced, but you can actually, you know, connect those things with your phone, organize your wardrobe and so on, if that might be of interest to you. And lastly, um, Internet of Things, or sorry, Internet of Me. So where do we fit as people within this larger network of all these things that we can connect from a technology perspective? I think where the Internet of Things gets more interesting is that as, you know, for those people that have, you know, wearables or things that we carry, I mean, all of us have our phone, which mine has just gone off 10 minutes, um, is that if we could use those things that we wear and carry, and especially within architecture spaces, how do we make that experience more interesting for ourselves? How can the environment respond? How can we you know, kind of enter a building, perhaps get information that's special just for us, that's relevant to us, and then how can we potentially um, impact that environment as well? I could just leave it there. <laughs> that wasn't my intention, but following you, it makes sense. Um, it's supposed to be red. Uh, so, sorry, it sounds like there's a bit of feedback here. Um, I think there are going to be a lot of parallels, actually, in my talk uh, between what Tom and Ren were just saying, as a matter of fact, because part of the concepts of what I'm talking about, uh, part of it will talk about process, which is kind of what this first slide is about. Um, but we're kind of investigating, you know, at Dialogue, um, we're kind of seeing a major shift in architecture from uh, what we're kind of considering a more linear or parallel process right now, which is, um, you know, the common sort of, you know, start at the beginning of, uh, you know, ideation creation, uh, translating that into uh, an analog form, which is a sketch, which gets then converted into some sort of digital format or gets interpreted computationally. So you take the principles of the idea in the sketch and then you convert that into a digital form. You test that with 3D printing and uh, then at a larger scale, obviously, with a building. And the idea is that, you know, at the scale of building, you're then informing some of the technologies and passing that all the way back down the line to the idea. So the cycle kind of continues back and forth. So those little guys are running like crazy, those little men on top, and then they're parachuting down into different areas of the process along the way in a linear fashion. Um, of course, the next step to this that we're kind of thinking is that, you know, obviously we have uh, huge inventory and projects that work this way, so there's no need to change that. Um, but those little arrows and those elements at the bottom with the little robotic head and the brain, uh, which is kind of scary to some people, and the uh, icon, which is supposed to represent a database, is the fact that just because we're using a more linear process, and obviously there's a better way that I'm going to talk about on the next slide, uh, doesn't mean that we can't actually gain and um, categorize, sort, and collect that information and kind of warehouse it in a usable way that we can then push back into projects down the road. So uh, not completely and entirely AI, which is what we're looking into right now, but more or less machine learning. So, you know, when you have uh, an office of 700 people and, you know, tens of thousands of projects, you need to think about your work a little bit more efficiently and how you may actually use things over and over again as opposed to reinventing the wheel every single time, which doesn't really make a lot of sense and wastes a lot of energy. So what we're, of course, seeing is that... Um, and don't worry, I'll get to fabrication in a moment, <laughs> um, is that it is actually not a linear process. It's a nonlinear process, so that little man actually runs in circles, not in a line, back and forth. Um, but the idea is that all of these elements are connected, and they're not connected at points along a path. They're actually interconnected all the time in every way, shape, or form. Now, this is... Um, of course, which is all being, again, fed into the same sort of machine learning database initiative. Um, this is great, and, uh, you know, this 
is kind of one step beyond linearity, but of course, when you start to think about things in the realm of uh, physical space and, uh, of course, kind of why we're here today, which is to actually bring things from the screen into reality, is that, and this is where the medium fails me, so forgive me, is that the graphic on the right-hand side is actually supposed to be a sphere. So the idea is that disk actually gets turned into a three-dimensional object where these are not just planar elements where... Uh, you're connecting all of these linear objects. It's actually a three-dimensional co-collaborative space where it actually involves more than just a process, but actually involves now people's ideas and different points of view in the process. So it's actually a three-dimensional process, not really either uh, circular or nonlinear versus linear. Um, and so that's kind of... Uh, and obviously there's a whole amount of information that you gain from kind of thinking this way and developing buildings in this manner. Um, and so that's when things like VDC, uh, you know, virtual design and construction kind of come into play, which is this idea of virtually designing but then also testing and fabricating components at not just the scale of, say, the size of your fist or a 10 by 10 by 12 bin of 3D printing material, but at the scale of a human being of like 10 by 12 by 15 feet, right? Um, and so what I've done is I've actually just brought a project uh, from my previous uh, company, which is kind of the embodiment of this process. And so um, what happened initially is obviously we have the idea of the concept or the sketch, which is a gesture, and some of you might actually recognize this building. Um, and the gesture actually... You know, this is actually one of my sketches. So, you know, the gestural concept is obviously something that's familiar to all of us, but then the conversion from the idea of what those lines mean into something tangible and computationally derived, these are not engineering drawings or drawings drawn by an engineer. They're actually, it's a relational diagram that expresses elements that are geometrically derived and how they relate to each other to create a form. Now, all of those elements are actually linked to real-world physical knowledge, which is something that I've gained over my last 15 years in construction and practice. So um, what we do is we take those sketches right now and we're converting those sketches into computationally driven objects. Now, these are just some grasshopper graphs and some uh, 3D, uh, uh, well, I, for lack of a better word, these are kind of sketches, they're not drawings yet, but essentially what these are meant to do is they're meant to explore elements that happen as a result of having to make something real. So the brick patterns are actually, the, the whole reason that they exist and the whole objective there was to actually identify, categorize, and layer each course and uh, brick in the course to identify to a contractor what color and format brick was required at that exact specific location. So this actually comes from the idea that somebody has to put this together. How do they do this, right? We need to be able to tell them. Um, and then on the right is essentially um, a glue laminated structure for, of all things, uh, a series of highway rest stops in Alberta. Uh, something that you would think would be seemingly boring and, and uh, benign, but the uh, client, which was the province of Alberta, wanted uh, a vernacular response. So the idea is, right now, I've pulled this thing to the side to show what happens when you kind of turn it into spaghetti, but what happens is that there are a, a series of vernacular uh, objects or uh, parameters that actually pull and contort this thing to where it needs to go, and what you're seeing is a representation uh, in color which expresses how, uh, what stress these members are under when they're pulled and pushed into different directions. So to go back to that sketch that I showed at the beginning, this is the project that's actually Lansdowne Stadium. And so uh, the connection here is, uh, or sorry, not the connection rather, but uh, what Ren was just saying a few moments ago when she said, you know, uh, you want to go shopping for these uh, objects and what do people want to shop for is I kind of look at some of the stuff that I do as people going shopping for buildings uh, or parts of buildings, right? So you start out and you think, uh, this is my idea. It's glamorous. It's amazing. But you realize at some point you have to pay for it. Um, and, and then you realize what your kind of restrictions are. And sorry, I hope I'm not taking too much time. 
Um, and so, you know, in this case, I like to actually, that was the perfect analogy because I thought that's exactly what we were doing here. We were actually shopping for connections because we had to figure out what connection details would actually uh, economize this thing because we had uh, 2,500 individual glue lamb cut pieces that we needed to fabricate and we had to find a way to do that in a, uh, in a constructive manner and an economical manner. So we had to take a $7 million skin and turn it into three and a half. It ended up being four, by the way. Um, so essentially, um, you know, we ended up using things like uh, computation to automate the process. Now, the idea, uh, computation is a great thing. Uh, it really has no bounds and it kind of has a mind of its own. But what you need to know is that people need to understand process, right? They need to understand physical material. So if you're working with something like uh, glue laminated timber, which is an extruded object, uh, you have a couple of options. You can only really ever bend in one direction unless you twist, and twisting usually requires another method of creation, which is other than laminating layers of timber together, you take a solid block of material and you mill away. Um, but we didn't have a budget for something like that, so we had to actually find a way computationally um, to virtually deliver through using uh, ways to figure out what the limitations of the robot were, uh, each of these 2,000 pieces. So what you can see here on the screen is a little spreadsheet that identifies what the variables are here on the lower left. And you can see the overall shape of those members and where they go, and then the solid model itself. So what happened was the design was derived, everything was rationalized and figured out for tolerance. And then what was sent to a machine was literally a solid model file, and that was it. And then 2,500 pieces arrived on site, and things were bolted on, and they were put in place and fastened, and that was it. Now, um, here's a shot from the factory. Um, the reality is, is that um, I don't know if I'd ever do that again, because um, wood is a natural material, and, and wood has life, right? So anyone who's ever worked with uh, wood on an architectural scale understands that there's a 4% shrinkage ratio uh, and expansion ratio, which when you're building something 140 meters long, is can be a real pain in the ass uh, if you don't actually account for that tolerance. So you really have to think a lot about how you're doing things. Uh, anyhow, in, in, uh, this is just a shot from a factory, which obviously shows that there are uh, aspects of this that you know are done by humans, and there are aspects that are done by machines. And so you kind of have to pick and assemble your process and your methods based on what makes sense, right? It doesn't always make sense to use a machine because sometimes a machine costs way more money in time to be sitting there doing one thing over and over again when you could actually split up that task and have a person doing part of that and the machine doing the other half. Um, and what's also really important is the fact that you know, what we, what we use uh, computation a lot for is to understand, like I was saying before, what are the tolerances, and not just tolerances of what machines are doing, but what are the tolerances of a human or what is a, ca a human capable of, right? So in this case, you know, we've got what looks like ants installing this giant piece uh, assembly, which actually gets put together on the ground and then lifted by a crane into place. And there's a guy with a rope pushing the pin through the connection where those things join together, and we're talking like thousands and thousands of pounds. So there's an extreme, uh, relatively high amount of precision happening on something that is very large and robust, um, but at the same time, um, you know, we've, uh, I wouldn't say we've designed it that way. Hopefully it all goes well, right? Because you try and figure out as much as you can beforehand. But th the idea is that we're using uh, these principles throughout the entire process, I including uh, where it comes to actually delivery and install. Um, and so here's a shot that shows uh, the cranes with the roof kind of on. Um, those cross members, those purlins, are, uh, there are uh, roughly 2,400 or 2,500. And then the mains, uh, we call those primaries. And so those are glue laminated, uh, glue -laminated timber. Uh, and so that's a shot from across the Rideau. Um, I'll say the, the interesting thing here when it comes down to economy is, um, you know, because computation is essentially a blank slate, you're literally building uh, a rig. And in this case, we're actually building the concepts of fabrication and our limitations of structurally as well as what we can make into the rig itself. So we know that we can pretty much make any bending radius we want, but we would have to use timber segments that are literally like 10 millimeters thick. 
right, which is a huge waste of wood, especially when you can only get it in 19 and 38 mil thicknesses, right? So you're effectively cutting away half the material to get a really tight bending radius. And so what we tried to do is economize as well as on the connections to say, okay, um, we know we don't want to go less than a 38 millimeter. What's our max bending radius? Then you take into account what is the max shipping size. And so that's why we have a connection across the back. And the connection suits the arc, which is the design derivative. So all of this uh, is just to say that the idea of making is an absolutely integral part to the whole process of the design. And it doesn't start at the end when you figure it out, it actually comes back to the beginning and helps inform and drive the process. And in some cases, some people might call them limitations, but I think of them more as opportunities. Uh, so that's pretty much it. So everything that was fun is gone because um, <laughs> Tom asked me to delete everything. So uh, what is this? This is, this is the lake, oh, my name is Monia. Uh, this is the Lake of Toronto in relation to the Lake of Tr uh, Zurich, uh, the scale. And uh, I just wanted to show uh, where I'm actually working at. Um, I'm working in uh, Toronto with my brother, Hamia, and we are running Meonia together. In, um, in Zurich, I'm working uh, together with Benjamin Dellenberger on the right side. Uh, we are running a team. He's the, uh, he's the head of the team. We are running a team that is called Digital Building Technologies. And we are part of EDH, focusing on additive manufacturing. So as the lake gets smaller, the team gets larger. Um, if you search uh, on Google about additive manufacturing, you will see a lot of projects coming out uh, on architecture and additive manufacturing, and you will find a lot of interesting images, um, which is fascinating, but uh, our team has a different focus. Um, we, we, we focus on high resolution architecture. And uh, because we don't want to create wor the whole world, we just want to create new world. and. Uh, we think there is a beauty within 3D print technology. It allows for geometric complexity and it brings a new opportunity that you should capture. Uh, and when looking at the 3D printing um, machines, there are thousands of them around. The one we are mostly using is the one to one, the large 3D printer. Uh, this 3D printer is a four by two meter by one meter. It uses binder jetting technology to um, bind sand uh, in every, every layers that it adds on. So basically when using such a technology, uh, which gives you a freedom of printing anything, you should be able to have computational tools that allows you to also design anything. That we develop ourselves because it doesn't really exist out there. And uh, you might ask then, well, if the 3D printing is so amazing, why don't we see it in the building? Let's not get so fancy about it. Because uh, basically uh, it doesn't have a high strength, uh, tensile strength. It's very good in compression. It can't deal with weathering. Uh, if you put it outside after three, third rain, you can't have it anymore. So um, this is uh, the new path we are taking. The next projects I'm going to show you is a combination of new technology and let's say old. Um, we are we are combining 3D printing with casting in different way because we would like to use the technology today for a real world project, for actual project. So uh, one of the methods that we've been developing uh, is been combination of sand print and high performance fiber reinforced com concrete. Here, there is a composite element that we develop. And um, for doing that, we've done a, quite a lot of studies together with our uh, material science team. Here, we studied how concrete and 3D, 3D printed sandstone interface, um, how strong the bond between the two material are. Uh, we examined the rheology of the concrete. Uh, when does the fiber doesn't pass through because they're long? So we studied the geometry of sand print in relation to the mixture that we have. Uh, we tested this into a, in a one-to-one -one scale ceiling prototype. Uh, this ceiling prototype is developed for a NEST project, which I will show later. Here, the formwork is 3D printed, and then uh, we clean the sand, uh, which is 80 mill eight millimeter um, formwork. Then we casted the, 
sorry, I took away the slide. I casted the concrete inside. So um, the other ceiling prototype which we developed with the same uh, method is this one. Um, it has an organic complex form which is generated uh, based on topology optimization. We use an algorithm to uh, optimize the amount of material we use for a ceiling. And if those of you who work with the concrete, you know, uh, lighter it becomes, more uh, useful it is. And uh, this is an optimized version uh, of the ceiling we had. Uh, it's uh, cast, you have the concrete now inside, you see the concrete casted and the formwork outside. Um, well, before optimization, you would have to use 270 liter of uh, concrete, but in this case now we are using only 50 liter of concrete. So we reduce the material up to 82 percent. Um, this led us to develop more projects on casting concrete. So we basically start thinking about how can we use 3D print as a formwork for concrete. Uh, and uh, we developed uh, the surface uh, treatment uh, together with some material science team and the concrete uh, spraying team uh, to find out what is the best way to spray this uh, formwork to get the best resolution of the concrete. And right now, uh, we are designing a one-to-one -one scale. This is an actual project that has to be finished by 2017. It's a ceiling uh, with 96 square meter. Uh, the formwork is uh, printed and then uh, we cast concrete inside. That's the building. Uh, every team will have their parts exhibited there for forever, hopefully, if it doesn't collapse. Um, and we are quite excited about this. This is almost one of the first buildings that would be built with such method. Um, we also, again, uh, develop our own computational tools and script to compute the form or, let's say, uh, explore the vari variation of the form we can have. We can calculate the amount of concrete we have because we are limited with the amount of load we can bring to this building. Um, and we have another floor that comes on top of us. So there is a lot of calculation going on. Um, another project that uh, we have been working on, it's a Venice Biennale. Have anyone seen this? No. This is a project together with Christian Carrots, an architect in Switzerland. Um, we, uh, we worked on the Venice Biennale. This is what you see here is a 20 millimeter glass fiber. Uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, and to achieve that, we basically um, computed, uh, f developed scripts and algorithms to compute formwork for any free form geometry. What you see here is the formwork where we have generated out of the form that we got from him. Then um, the formwork are printed. This is the back side of the formwork. Here is the fr front side of the formwork with all the uh, post processing. And then um, this is the 3D model of the formwork showing, um, showing the tagging and uh, basically how we would nest them in 3D print. This seems very simple, but it would, it would save us quite a lot of Swiss franc by nesting them right in the 3D print. And these scripts are developed within the team um, with, uh, with a few people that I showed in the beginning. Um, the I think almost last project from Digital Building Technology is this one. Uh, here we use the 3D print. This is a very recent project. It's a two-month project that I've done with the MIS student, uh, the Master of Advanced Studies. And I believe it's the first time that we casted uh, steel and aluminum in 3D print. Um, we are developing connections for space frame structures. Uh, the idea came from car industry. They used 3D print already to cast uh, cars parts, like motors, um, engines, and different things. Um, when I saw that, I thought, why don't we use this in architecture? Why don't we use 3D print and cast uh, steel, uh, aluminum, all these steel parts that we are using in the building? So with the students, we generated a space frame structure, uh, which is an ongoing installation right now as I left. Um, for that, we generated or develop a number of ways to generate um, joints and the way we develop the mold within the joints because every joints are different. It's more than 200 joints within the space frame and every single joint has a different shape, different form and different detailing. Um, you don't want to make mold for every single of these 
joints. And then, uh, yeah, that's a computational uh, model that we generate the mold for the joints, and then we put them on the runners where the uh, aluminum is going to uh, flow through and um, goes up to the joints. Uh, just walk it through very quickly. Some images, these are the 3D printed uh, mold for the joints. And this is a video as you assemble all of them, as I showed in 3D model, you take them uh, to the casting area and they would then cast aluminum uh, into the center and the aluminum will flow upward. This process needs to be very well controlled because first aluminum, uh, you have to clean the mold quite well. Otherwise, aluminum would not flow through, and then you would have joints that are half, um, half joint and half nothing. And then uh, you would also have to count for shrinkage of the aluminum, shrinkage of the steel. And uh, you have to um, you have to do a lot of prototyping before you get this right. And in the last two months, I must say the 18 students have been working uh, quite a lot to get this project uh, happening. What you get after this process is this guy. And uh, these are uh, six joints connected to a runner. And then you would post-process these joints, and then you would get more than 200 joints that are very different from each other geometrically, and they allow you to connect them together to create such a space frame structure. This is the night before I come, so it's still under construction. Um, yeah, uh, this is the morning, uh, they were still assembling, and I took some very quick pictures from the joints, sorry for the quality of the images. I really, this is the last joints that I'm showing you. Yeah. Uh, what I like about uh, these uh, large joints on the ground is the resolution of the surface, if you could see there. Uh, that the aluminum can really catch all of this detailing that we modeled uh, in 3D. And um, the next project I'm showing is halfway through, so I'm just showing three slides. Uh, doing this, I thought about like, why don't we cast aluminum facade for building, or why don't we cast steel facade for the building? And then a month before the project was about to finish, uh, we modeled a very quick surface and uh, did a quick test about how to cast surface, uh, like a more panelized surface. And uh, the result wasn't so, uh, it wasn't as I expected, but it was uh, quite good with the detailing and resolution. But of course, parts were not uh, fully casted. As you see here, there are parts that are cracked because uh, the, the mold was too thin. So I'm, I'm finished with DBT. I'll show one Facebook project, and I'm still on time. Um, I would like to finish my presentation with a project we did for uh, Facebook Toronto here. Um, we were commissioned with a Facebook office in Toronto. It was a competition. And uh, what I showed up to now was projects where we combine new technology, 3D printing, and an old uh, casting method. And um, I'm just showing this project because to me this is also not totally new. This is a mathematical surface being used for maybe a few hundred years. And what we did uh, in our office with, uh, with my brother, uh, we regenerated this surface, we modified it, and we remodeled it. And then we rationalized the surface for, uh, for it to be built from panelized um, panelized material uh, according to its curvature and according to material and fabrication constraint that we had, uh, which led to uh, this installation. This is, an, uh, this is a permanent installation. Uh, through automation, more than 7,000 geometrically different parts were fabricated from two millimeter acrylic sheets. And it was tagged and assembled in a coherent whole. Um, just to get, a, get an idea of the scale, uh, this is a three by three meter by three meter large artifact. It's self-supporting and it weighs only 60 kilogram. It was available uh, and possible because we could compute the optimal curvature of the surface because we could precisely produce the parts and bring them together in this installation. Um, and yeah, another image and my final slide with this Toronto project. Um.
Um, okay, so I just I, I just want to um, like return to the sort of central topic that we were looking at. We we heard a lot of very amazing ideas uh, and saw some fantastic work and some really interesting methodologies. Um, but if, in thinking about new design and technology synergies, um, I think that, as I say, we've seen a lot of really interesting um, comments and work. Um, if I were to ask, then, the questions that were framed at the beginning of this evening, um, I think that we can run through those relatively quickly, but I think it would be worthwhile to ask them nonetheless. So f the first one was, what are, these, what are the sort of new methods of design and production? So what are the new methods? Um, I think I might comment that We've seen some very particular methodologies, in particular from Manya, but at the same time, given the diversity of the panel, I might... Just turn it on when you're going to talk. But I was going to... Um, so let's maybe... I'm going to ask for two, two answers to that. The first I want to direct to Ren, um, where there's within this discussion of technology, there is also some really important questions that I think Ren's work is supportive of, and that has to do with human-centered design, um, design for various populations. So firstly, so what are, the, what are the kind of new methodologies in the context of design and technology, Ren, uh, that you see coming forward? Um, I think in terms of where, where I'm finding sort of the most success in terms of feedback would actually be testing more, um, or in terms of integrating new technology is actually testing more, or maybe the word's not testing, more doing um, co-creative workshops and uh, sessions with kids. And specifically because they're, well, they're very tech enabled. Um, and kids, what I mean by that is like uh, from eight to 13 year olds. And uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of the term that a lot of people are starting to call this generation, but generation visual, that the, uh, the way that they communicate, the way that they um, send and receive information is more through photography. And then also um, for things like augmented reality and virtual reality, that they're so much more able to suspend their disbelief is that they just, that's part of the world in which they interact and they don't have the same inhibitions or limitations that adults do. Um, to be less vague, it's like I've done, uh, you know, a workshop with kids with, um, you know, within 20 minutes they can, you know, easily, um, you know, kind of make a physical prototype, including, you know, sort of hardware, so Arduino components or, you know, things that are modifiable, customizable, they'll make a wearable that they feel is um, representative of how they would interact in the world. Um, they talk about the Internet of Things, they talk about themselves being like Wi-Fi networks and so on. And I'll do the same, you know, workshop with, you know, maybe two hours with adults and I don't get the same results. Um, we will talk about, you know, safety, security, and kids will talk about that as well. But the, um, the methods in terms of more that one-on-one -on -one or interview with two people, um, you know, if you interview one person, you don't necessarily know if what they're saying is really true. Sometimes they're trying to please you, but, you know, interviewing people, you know, with a pair that you always have someone that will... Um, check up on that person and right away that the um, conversation is also more social and more conversational because they know someone else in the room. So those would be sort of two techniques, um, you know, sharing more with kind of that younger generation that you're designing for to kind of find things that are unexpected and new and then in the formats of, you know, interviews and conversations that doing that sort of pairs is working, uh, works a lot better. Um, I mean, I'll comment that the design fabrication zone, and certainly for many of us, um, trying to work in this kind of um, difficult space between kind of making and fabrication on the one hand and various other kind of design related as well as, again, at Ryerson, kind of entrepreneurial interested activities. It's, there's a, a, real, a real kind of question about what the spaces are, what the, what the kind of methods um, uh, of, of production are on the one hand and then how one starts to kind of convey those things or starts to create an environment where where people can learn about them or can try things. Um, with that in mind I would love to ask Manya's opinion on this in the context really we have on the, on the left hand side or on my left like two a really good representative from let's say from kind of practice and, and, and the sort of architectural scale so Mark Sishi has been showing us this work that is really like this really robust complex geometry work at an architectural scale in the meantime what Manya really has been showing is this very complex uh, intensive research based very inventive architectural work 
that is heavily immersed in kind of new technologies. And so the question I would, I I would love to frame, because we've got a really good view on how those procedures are being, are, are, are being carried out. Is there any opportunity, either for Mark or for Manya, in the, in the kind of arena where you're working to, what are those opportunities to kind of convey that work or to bring people in, into the process or to work collaboratively? Maybe, Mark? Am I green? Yeah, okay. Um, so I actually wanted to comment, <laughs> to say, uh, not in specifically that regard, but I will answer that question, is um, uh, what I showed in construction in general is not, um, buildings in general are not the product of uh, just the architect or a single entity, right? They're, uh, they're a collaboration with many entities and many sophisticated uh, moving parts, clients obviously as well. Um, and so without everyone kind of getting on board, uh, it's kind of impossible to deliver something like that, right? So there are so many little intricate parts to that whole process. And um, I think to answer that question in part, there, are, there is the technological aspect, right, which uh, enables us to actually create or mill or fabricate, right, these things, uh, bring them into reality. Um, but there is... Uh, also, the technical technological aspect that allows all entities to actually collaborate and work together, which is um, a huge uh, aspect of like moving forward. It's one thing to work in teams of ten and twelve and you know tens and twenties and, and and even hundreds. It's another thing when you have like a four million square foot building. And there are all kinds of uh, sophisticated, computationally driven, and um, you know, uh, crazy geometric objects that need to be fabricated. And on that scale, it's insane, right? So it just clogs the 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 queue. Um, and so um, I think right now it's a huge challenge um, in terms of moving forward um, to actually. Uh, employ these things at that really large scale. Um, certainly at a, at a smaller scale or even, you know, like a 50,000 square foot building or something like that or 100,000 is doable. But once you get to like the super scale where, you know, some of these P3s that some people kind of cringe at and they think, ooh, P3. Um, these are some of the things that could actually benefit hugely from the ideas of like uh, what you were showing with uh, you know mass fabricated 3D concrete structures, where you could economize on like all of the connections, reduce the weight of concrete, which would have a huge effect on something of that scale. So I think we kind of sometimes get lost in the idea of making these really fancy and beautiful things, but at the same time miss the like a, a major opportunity in the sense that for economy scale, like reducing concrete by 82 percent is huge, right? So I, I, that's how I kind of I guess see it or come. In, in the context of Manya, your, work, your research work, um, would, would you in, in not only respond to that, but also maybe give, give us a bit of an indicator how the, the, let's say, the public, even the, let's say, the Swiss public, and we don't really know what their relationship to this kind of work, this pretty sophisticated work, might be compared to what our, you know, citizens here might think of this kind of stuff. You're really, there's a lot of good funding for these kind of research initiatives and there's in, incredible facilities. Um, is it a kind of a hermetic box or, you know, we, we can maybe, I'd love for you to address its relationship to the kind of, you know, real construction work that Mark is talking about and involved in, but also what might, how might it, and it or is it in some way opened up to, to, the, to the extent that the public or kids, as, as Ren has been articulating, these kids who have all this capacity and they're really learning these new things very easily, how could, is, is there a kind of, a, are there some avenues there? So there are too many questions now. I take care of the kids first. Um, well, there are some kids visiting the schools. I was not involved personally knowing what they are doing, but they are visit visitors from public because the Swiss, uh, the NCCR is a Swiss funded um, institution. So this is uh, money that comes from the public. So they are very aware of what's happening. Uh, but it's usually in terms of visiting and uh, not interaction with the thing itself because the facilities are super expensive and you can't just uh, open it up to everyone. Uh, in terms of uh, collaboration within academia, uh, 
uh, or outside academia. There is a two different pattern. With outside academia, we don't have so much problem because most of the project we are running uh, are um, collaborated with um, very large concrete companies or um, uh, steel casting companies because they see the future in it. And uh, in Switzerland, uh, luckily these companies are large. Uh, some of them are German, some of them are French. And they, uh, they would like to take part uh, in the project. Uh, internally, um, the collaboration is also very easy. Uh, I find it very easy in NCCR because NCCR is set uh, with the agenda of developing and advancing technology for architecture. Where I used to work before in Sweden, it was a collaborative situation, but it was much more difficult to collaborate because you were an architect, you had your own agenda, and then you would go to a structural engineer, a professor, or anyone, you would ask them to help you with topology optimization. They would say, well, what do I get out of this? Can I write a paper? If they want to write paper, it becomes too technical. It's not useful for an architect. If I want to do something, it's not useful for them because it's in a different level. But in NCCR, the people, I skip three pages of showing who are these 88 members that are there. We have we have uh, material scientists, we have um, robotic control system, and we have people from different disciplines that are employed uh, to develop their research, but within the direction of development and advancement for architecture and construction. This is very important. Uh, and it, it moves everything to a different level because uh, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to sacrifice so much of your time here. Manya, thank you very much. That's a very, very um, interesting sort of uh, the way things are organized there is really illuminating. Um, what I was um, wanting to the, the next question on this on that that I want to address is is I want to address it just in a very specific way. Which the question is, who are the new practitioners, and what is their relation to legacy designers, engineers, and associations? Again, I I I will take the third question which has to do more with universities and maybe throw that around between Ren and Manya and maybe myself but in the case of this specific aspect of that question I do want to get Mark's uh, um, view on this so he and I have both been kind of in the, this arena in and around the OAA where they've been asking those of us that are interested in and kind of practitioners in design and technology and fabrication material systems etc what the associations doing or right or doing wrong are the the architects that are out there like the architects over 50 or those that didn't get learn these kinds of things when they were in school what do they how do we reach out to those people or, or do we or in what way um, mark i think has articulated that the the, the, the kind of the it, it takes a tribe to build a building like that that one we were looking at in ottawa it isn't just architects it's just architects engineers fabricators all working together but thinking specifically about the associations and about the professions, like are they too far gone? Are they kind of ossified in this country? Or can we kind of bring some of these new techniques into play? Heavy question. <laughs> Holy cow, that one's loaded. Um, I should be careful because at one time I actually considered myself the young one. I very recently realized that I wasn't, not only due to the fact of my what's going on up here, but just in general, when I actually see younger people coming in, the people we're hiring and, and what we're looking for. And, um, my God, that's a really tough question. Um, no, nobody's too far gone. <laughs> um, uh, Your firm is making progress. I mean, they hired you yes. to, to deal with right. computation so, uh, issues, right? Yeah, I, I guess I should see that as a positive. So, uh, I mean, yeah, we're a firm of, what, 700 people. Um, uh, I don't want to be uh, confident is the word, but say like, I guess they did something right. Like they realized that they were slipping down a path where they, you know, there are a lot of bright people, obviously, you know, just because you're old doesn't mean you're not intelligent. But, uh, you know, there, uh, I think certainly there is, um, you know, there are two points of view. One is um, the seeing the value. Um, you know, a lot of people could look at this pessimistically and say, oh, yeah, well, it makes a whole lot of cool little things for research and whatnot, but how does that actually, uh, you know, relate to what I do every day? Um, and some people have a hard time making that connection, but I think today we kind of illustrated some ways of doing that. Um, I think that um, 
there are kind of three generations. So there's the generation that is has been running and doing things for some time. There are my generation, which is kind of in the middle, and then there, uh, and then there's a the younger generation that's coming in. And and the younger generation obviously um, understands the value, and this is what they just this is inherently what they do every day. It's what they learn in their education, most of them, um, and it's how they think. Um, for my generation, um, there are very few people that kind of think that way and, and understand. I guess you and I are in the same generation. Um, and then obviously above that, um, there are those who either want to or don't want to understand and, and make their decision, decisions rather accordingly. Um, I think the uh, OEA, for uh, its, its part, um, made a great... Uh, sort of kind of like reaching out to us and kind of strategizing bringing people like Martin Reese I think uh, Tom showed some of his work there on uh, the Zaha building there um, and kind of trying to engage this idea of uh, kind of closer collaboration uh, which I believe is the beginning of uh, you know this VDC initiative which I think is very huge because it incorporates things like AR and VR into the process of design which is kind of I think the next phase of where the profession is going um, but it's uh, absolutely um, within everybody's reach to just do this. All it requires is a little bit changing uh, direction and a pivot as opposed to an about face. Um, we're, we're using the same principles of what we've done. It's just we're using new technologies to deploy it. Absolutely. Um, listen, I think what would make sense, and I'm going to direct this question towards both um, Manya to have a crack at it as well as to Ren. But the, the one is, what are the universities doing to engage these changes um, in design and production? So that's one side of things. And let's just say, adding on to that question for the sake of just getting a kind of more holistic answer, what are the spaces and networks in the city? Let's say in this city, but in the case of Manya, we, you can make me make some comments about your other, um, your career in Europe, um, that are emerging within this kind of evolving context. So it's, what is, how are the universities, how are they or should they be engaging in these kind of questions of a sort of turning over of the soil or a changeover that's brought along by but it's also looking towards new techniques and technologies and then secondly what are the spaces that you see emerging or that you think should be emerging that would start to kind of accommodate for some of these changes so maybe first um have you had a chance to go for a while Ren? maybe manya first um in terms of space um, if you search, I mean, in terms of asking if we should have it or not, I would say just if you search uh, digital fabrication in architecture, you will find 80% of the, of the frontier architecture school having these uh, facilities. So that's out of questions. The digital um, fabrication will be there and the future will be digital. Uh, but. Construction has been always slow. Uh, bringing it to school or not, to me that's not really a question and I don't find Toronto difficult for that. I find Toronto indeed a better place for bringing new technologies. It's very open. Toronto is very open to new things. Uh, people are very open to um, uh, to get new technology and even engage with it uh, much more than the European country, uh, countries that I've been at. So I think definitely why not? You already mm, showed me the facilities you have, those small, uh, but uh, that can expand. Uh, plus, I think beside the tools, it's also the people that you bring in. Um, sometimes the people you bring in are more important than the tools because you can have the tools, but you don't know what to do with them but if you have the right people they can outsource the tool they can show the products as we did first in some places and then the play the, the people find the use for it they're like oh this is interesting so we need to buy a tool so it's a combination of, of having tools and the people right people and the right tools in the place to add to that, I mean, I, my sense is, is I, I agree. I think that's a really insightful comment. Um, and we do spend quite a bit of time, I spend quite a bit of time, I have a whole kind of folder set called facilities, and we're just constantly dealing with trying to set out new types of spaces. And it's really hard to find space in a downtown campus for the kind of, well, I mean, some of the casting, et cetera, that Manya was showing, that concrete work, you really need a, a certain kind of setup and lab in order to do that work and to do it safely, et cetera. So, 
very difficult. But the, the idea that we've come to a point with technology that the tools are like 3D printers, for example. There are a number of these CNC-driven devices that are commercially available that are becoming less and less expensive, more more user friendly uh, the the interfaces the computer the digital interfaces are becoming easier and easier to the point where i'm starting to recognize a kind of a tier of lower grade but very powerful machines that one can purchase for let's say under five thousand or under ten thousand dollars that can be used relatively safely in an environment let's say in an educational environment where people can learn on these things and then those things have very direct connections the the methodologies or workflows are almost identical to those that would be used uh, on larger machines, on industrial machines, and so in Toronto, I, I mean, I, I would agree with Manya. There's, a, there's a, there's some of the practitioners are starting to catch on. Some of the academics are catching on, and in, in, in a very interesting way, the, the, the people out in industry, like if I'm out in Etobicoke with, with a, with a fabricator or Mississauga or, or, or Hamilton, there are these really big spaces where there's big machines and there's lots of know-how out there. And these people are, are at a really at a distance from the, let's say, the university, but there is a kind of a practical knowledge that we're kind of now starting to engage in within the university context. I mean, I, I remember early, early days um, studying at UCLA when Greg Lynn kind of brought in the first CNC mill to a kind of architecture school, and it was like really a kind of a daring play. Like the, beyond that, there was always just like the wood workshop, and suddenly he was bringing in this other kind of cutting machine that could cut your digital files directly, and it was just really exciting to see. So for me, the, the, to continue on this, on this, on this topic, the, uh, the idea that the universities, I think, are very well positioned to kind of get into play, and it's sometimes slightly scaled down versions. Aren't they're not scaled down in the sense that we as architects consider small scale versus large scale. They're scaled down because the processes are almost identical to full scale. Um, granted, as 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 Mark would attest, the material behaviors are always going to be slightly different for smaller scale artifacts than the kind of full scale ones. But let's just say that for as for, for the purpose of teaching and experimentation, I think that the the cost of the equipment and the facilities is actually quite manageable. And then it comes to Manya's other point that really it's trying to find the people that have the training and the interest and the kind of inventiveness, these sort of engineering profile people that are also interested in design that can actually handle tooling paths so they can sketch, but they can also sketch with a computer. Um, it's very, very difficult. And that's why, in a way, I want to kind of return the question back to Ren into the sort of teaching environment and to the Ren has tons of experience running these kind of design technology workshops, and she's watched as kids and adults kind of work collaboratively in these very frameworks. And, and to, to sort of maybe get you to comment on this question as well. Yeah, I, I'll try not to deviate too much because I think my, my world is uh, different from the architecture, which is probably obvious so far from my comments. But the, the one thing I find that there's, um, so if I talk sort of that hardware, software, um, some of the audiences from that world as well, but there's certainly, you know, no, one, one thing I find in Toronto, there's no lack of events. So a hackathon, you probably could go to a hackathon um, each week and, uh, you know, eat and drink for free. It's a great <laughs> way to survive as a student. Um, you know, Ryerson, tons of zones, tons of hackathons. Um, probably about a year and a half ago, I mean, I was entrepreneur in resident at Launch Zone when it first opened. And so one of the things that I had looked to initiate with the engineering faculty was instead of, call, well, for one, I um, found like my, my experience going to hackathons was I'm not a coder, I'm not a developer, so I would go and I don't have that ability to, you know, hack and code. <laughs> so I'd be left kind of, you know, sort of on the outskirts of, you know, that experience not being able to kind of hack that thing that existed. So one thing that um, I helped initiate was instead of first calling it a hackathon, was calling it a, uh, a make day competition, like sort of changing the, the word and the feeling that you might have um, when you're at that event changed it, but was also instead of having it just as a, a heads down two day, um, you know, take this piece of technology and see how you might modify it and customize it based on what it was, was that we did it as kind of either running over two weeks uh, a series where you could um, come and learn about sort of consumer behavior, some trends, some insights, so kind of things like what's happening in the world. Um, that you know called out to different types of faculties. So I'll give you one example. We called one was uh, reengineering fashion. Another one was called reinvent sports. And then we had another series called Internet of Things. And with each of these, we looked to you know invite the designers, the engineers, the you know fashion. I mean Ryerson has such a massive 
faculty that we were able to draw in, you know, the um, interest from, from different faculties. But the experience was, was very different that we looked to create sort of multidisciplinary teams, people that could work together that wouldn't have within their own um, faculties, um, you know, kind of work together over time, but that they would kind of have this sort of, you know, what's, what's the opportunity, you know, what's the problem, but more of what's the opportunity in terms of things that we might create. Um, you know, working together through, you know, these three, three, four sessions, design workshops and so on, within the third day being this, what we called make day competition, which would run over the weekend, which then people like Tom nicely came with like materials, foam core, um, you know, fabric, 3D printing and so on to help them realize their ideas. And then you'd get the engineering crowd that would then help actually create something that would work. So I think that, I, I don't know if there's anything like that in architecture, but that would be, you know, something really interesting to, to look at. Um, and the other, in terms of, again, I find like there's actually, so you hear all these things going on in Toronto, but I, I find myself, I don't find it particularly accessible for the general public. Like it seems it's very institutionalized, if I say that, in terms of if you're a student, you have access to these things, but for um, older interaction designers, <laughs> industrial designers, um, assuming it's the same for architects, I'm curious what people in the audience would think, is that you have presentations you can go to and you hear about oh, this, this new technology and we see these wonderful things that, you know, fabulous architects, as an example, are creating. But to be able to then kind of meet other people that are also like-minded, because you're coming to the same session, but to have a breakout session or a workshop after that says, how can I access this? How can I do this? Who can I collaborate with? I find certainly within my world is missing. Sorry, I just, I... You guys have got caught me right on stream because I just, I'm sorry, I don't want to bring it out of education back to practice, but I just wanted to talk about, um, so because I teach at Ryerson, there's an element of kind of education that I guess I bring back to our office. And what we've started doing is just that, um, is that um, every studio is, well, almost every studio is outfit with 3D printing and, and laser cutting facilities. And we have, we hold, uh, we have internal initiatives where we basically hold uh, workshops across a series of three days. And they're all project driven. And so we gather teams, you're allowed to pick whoever you want from any office, any discipline. And this is part of that whole interdisciplinary thing because we have engineers, mechanical, electrical. So we get everyone together. Some of the times it, uh, you know, involves Arduino boards and Raspberry Pis and 3D printing and laser cutting. And you come up with uh, basically you spend two days working your butt off without sleep, and then third day you present to 700 people over uh, you know our internal video conferencing system. So the idea that um, that concept is kind of landlocked to education isn't entirely true because it's actually you know we're trying to find ways to pull out that idea of learning because that is really and, and some of the fruit of that of those ventures, actually we open source and we give back to the general context at large. So some of our grasshopper scripts, methods for fabricating, we'll actually post those and open source them um, to other people. So we don't take kind of a closed environment sort of approach. We try and work on the methodology. Um, I'm <clears throat> no, that's super interesting. Um, some, of the, some of the questions that come up on a regular basis in and around this kind of zone ecosystem really have to do with um, trying to establish sort of cross or multidisciplinary platforms for, for this type of collaborative work. It's just very difficult. Not only is it difficult within the, the, the let's say, the ecosystem of these incubators, and as you can, many of you know, like Ryerson is very big on entrepreneurship, and so that there's a kind of conflation of technique and entrepreneurship that can be kind of frustrating sometimes. Because often what the market is looking for that entrepreneurs are looking for is the kind of bottom line thing and what a lot of specialists are looking for is to kind of develop their technique and to refine that. And so there's a, there's a couple of kind of, you know, there's some, there's some missed communication that's going on there. But the other, uh, as far as the university goes, is that there's sort of a, you know, we're, we're dealing with, um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of different directions and ambitions around um, technical departments and disciplines at the university through engineering, architecture, also in, in, in faculty of communications here at Ryerson, so in, in like media arts. Um, there's a lot of things for the students to learn and so to try to kind of pull them out of their disciplinary kind of uh, cocoons and get them involved in these more open-ended exploits without losing track of making and of doing things of quality 
uh, is, is, a, is a real challenge, but at the same time, I think is a, is a, it's, it's pretty heartfelt that we're you know, trying to kind of move in that direction. Um, and it's super interesting to hear that a big, kind of a big mean architecture engineering firm is actually having people stay up late. <laughs> but like, I don't know if there's anybody here from NOR, NOR Architects, but they, I, I was at a, at a meeting or I gave a presentation at NOR on these topics actually, which was great. But they, we, the thing went a little late. It went to 5, 5.15, I think, or 5.30. And the, 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 the office building kind of locked down. So we actually couldn't like, leave the building. So there wasn't like this sort of studio environment as, as you might want to see or, or sort of strive for or yearn for, but rather it was a kind of a lockdown. Um, so there's a, the culture, I think, is, needs to thaw and change, and, and, and it's happening. You know, but it, you know, this event is a little bit about these very questions, of course. Um, OK. So I think that that, unless anyone else has anything to add just from up here, I was really, I really appreciate your, all of your comments. Um, we have a little bit of time still. I think we're getting close to 8 o'clock. But um, I d would definitely like to throw it open to the audience. And so um, we all have mics up here. Kira uh, at the back has a mic that we can pass around the audience or we can share. I might get one other somebody else to maybe send out mics if we need to. So why don't, we, um, why don't we take some questions from the audience if anyone has any comments or questions that might relate to the presentations they've seen or the, or the discussion we've been having up here. Okay, I'm just gonna give you my mic. Here, you're right there. Take it away. Um, this question for Ren. What would you suggest or recommend to have a wearable technology, not to get lost from technology, but keep up in pace? That's useful, affordable, and uh, um, current. For, sorry, what would you like to use it for? I regular guess that would be my question. Life, on time schedule, or not Fitbit that monitors walking steps, or <laughs> heart monitor, <laughs> something else. Something else. Something um, advanced than the cell phone, which seems to have everything now. Yeah, I think it's. I guess it's looking at. Um, you know, perhaps how you use, what, what are the things that maybe, uh, I'm not going to answer your question directly because I'd be curious to say, when your phone's in your pocket, what, do you, what, are, what would be the three to five things that you are trying to do when you have to sort of pull it out? It monitors my steps, so I know end of the day how much I have walked. Mm -hmm. So that's more than enough for me. Yeah, and, so uh, maybe it's yes, like a... I have emails and uh, reminders, mm -hmm. uh, books I want to read, um, what else? Time pass. What's up? Yeah. So I, I, I guess it's maybe looking at then, um, you know, maybe like an ecosystem in terms of, so if your steps, maybe it's a Fitbit or some type of a device that then you don't have to reach for your phone, mm -hmm. but then perhaps a ear pierce that could go, ear pierce, ear piece, <laughs> I can't even speak, that would go with that. Yeah, I'd love to chat with you more later. You can make some specific product okay. recommendations if you like. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask one more question to Mark? Uh, you talk about the linear communication versus spherical communication between the agencies, trade, and disciplines. Can you give a practical example on that? Yeah, I, I thought I showed one. <laughs> um, That's pictorial. I would like to some, see some practical, the difference. Oh, you mean the difference between a linear process? Yes, communication. That's um, the challenge for ongoing in the project. I, I would frame it to you that currently, um, the major difference would be what the project requirements are. So um, there, um, let's just say for, uh, let's use a really mundane kind of example, like a big box store or something like that, right? You, the traditional methods and technologies uh, where things are, I mean, although it's not entirely true, because I could give you another example of our firm where we're doing this, thinking about this a different way. But, um, well, okay, so let me do that. Let me back up. I'll answer that question. So we have projects which are kind of, we consider them more like gem, gem type projects where we wholeheartedly employ this idea because we're an inter interdisciplinary practice. Everyone has access to the same tools. And so um, we form tight partnerships with people like Ellis Don and PCL to work very closely. And so we know what their technologies are, their capabilities are, who their subs are. We embed that into our process. And from the very beginning, uh, what we're producing is a result of those affiliations and relationships. Um, from another perspective, like I was just saying, a big box store, is that we also do projects which are kind of like spec um, industrial. Okay, So they're kind of boring. But what we're trying to figure out is 
how can we enhance and uh, deliver something that is more comprehensive and in line with that idea of that more um, nonlinear process. And where we're starting to find that that kind of takes hold is in embedding computation in the process. So we'll find that we actually have certain modules and typical uh, scenarios and sets of rules where we can literally build and deploy an entire drawing set from start to finish with clicking a mouse, a mouse like 25 times, not even having to draw. It literally will produce an entire set of drawings from a collection of parts that we can assemble. So. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the question. Um, anyone else? Uh, there's, <laughs> there's a question from uh, one of the younger members of our audience out there. <laughs> Lucas. Um, this question is directed to Tom Bessai. Um, as managing director of the DF said, and um, principal architect in the um, Niagara Bessai Studios, what is your approach to um, bridging the gap between um, university and practice? Oh, you had some help with that question, I think. <laughs> That's not a typical teenager question. <laughs> When's dinner? Um, it's uh, there. It's a just. It's a good question. Um, the, there's there's very. Um, one only has so many hours in the day. Um, it's really difficult to to bridge in a kind of um, uh, in a practical and in an effective way between really kind of intensive commitments at the university and uh, and practice. I mean, as many practitioners here who are here know, it's really like full time. You're getting calls all the time from your consultants, uh, from your uh, clients, uh, things are going on on the construction site, very difficult to manage. Um, meanwhile, the, 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 the rigors around the university, especially around these zones which are very new, have really to do with uh, what are the kind of facilities that we have, what do we need, what are, where, how are our budgets kind of like falling through, especially my colleague Kira who's here, like what are we, are we actually serving our members properly, are we giving them what they want, <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of these really demanding uh, questions and very interesting ones that we're trying to kind of manage at, at the university, so um, there really are, there's no good answer for that except that I would suggest like some of these organizational strategies that a few of my colleagues have been alluding to both um, not so much Manya because I, I had probably the slides that she cut out were those slides that showed like the, the network of people working but certainly with Ren and Mark you saw that what they were trying to identify or, or, or show visualizations of were these kind of networks of people working together across various techniques, machines, roles, um, and, and users. And then that's, I think, really a, a kind of important thing to think about, whether we can develop you know, more effective ways or efficiencies in, 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 you know, as we open up uh, to these new types of techniques. Some of those new techniques, in fact, are about producing these organizational efficiencies. And I think that's actually always worth remembering. So thank you, Lucas. Uh, here we go. Question over here. Mike's coming your way. I think I'd just like to add upon that question. Like, okay, as designers or architects, we've always had like, the shifting or emerging techniques, and we've also changed the discipline according to that. So right now what architects are doing is uh, jumping on different hats. So you're working as, as a designer, then you're thinking about it as a material scientist. Sometimes you're focusing on the tools, so you're designing the computational tools and working as a computer scientist, and even a manufacturer or a fabricator. But what happens in the discipline is ed education, the pedagogy is changing, and that is helping it. What, what would you see or what would you look forward to in the discipline, or what are the changes? Adding more events or hackathons, which change this practice or functioning at an office, or is it the exposure? Where, where there's a huge gap between generations and then you want to interlink them? Like what would be a suggestion or potential direction towards that? Some of these guys to take a crack at that first and I can also make an answer, but maybe, uh, are you, Ren, do you have a comment first? I just, I, I, I'd be curious to know. Kind of what, what themes you'd be interested to develop in and, and I think that that could be super interesting to try a, I'd call it a make day competition or creative architecture, or creative, you know, architecture and creative technology, perhaps, just to broaden, perhaps, what it what it might be. 
but um, to have some, you know, like people like yourself, I mean, the hackathon or the make day competitions yeah. <laughs> that we did, that I've we did here before long enough, was, I mean, hackathons. it's, you know, similar to the sort of co-creation idea where you invite industry experts. So people like yourself that are the ones that are providing the, you know, the conversation and the discussion in terms of, you know, what's the theme of things that are happening? Uh, how do you see um, architecture changing some examples? How do you fabricate, imagine? The future, and then um, you know, kind of set the stage for teams of um, students, but also invite you know people, not just students, but entrepreneurs and people that are practicing to actually work with those actual groups, and then um, you know, see what the potential outcomes are. I think that would be you know super interesting to to try that out just to see what would happen. I'll be super short, actually. Um, I think. Um, I struggle with actually the same thing you do, which is like, how do you have so many hours to actually be here and then work, right? Uh, yeah, I don't respond to your emails very quickly, sorry. Um, but um, I think you need both sides of the coin, actually. I think you need both sides of everything, because if you're kind of just stuck in the same cycle of what you're doing every day, you never want to step outside or you never think a different way. And I think... Um, education and to a certain degree young people too because there's a certain sense of um, optimism or maybe it's a lack of awareness who knows um, tend to uh, use things in the ways that are not intended to be used um, and I think that is uh, also comes into play whenever you start to mix together groups of people who don't come from the same environment they take each other's things and they break them or they rearrange them and they make stuff out of it. And I think that's kind of um, what education, in a sense, can offer to a very rigid and focused profession uh, that has obviously a tremendous uh, liability and, and, and pragmatic things to think about. But there's also that element of creativity and whatnot, and I think that's where you kind of get those two areas coming together and adding value to one another. They borrow off each other, and hopefully you get something that's more in the middle as opposed to leaning one way or the other. Manya, do you want to maybe take a crack at some comments about that, this connection between practice and industry, sorry, practice and academia, and how those things can... How, how, in what ways we find, we, what ways we can find to, let's say, break the molds, the molds that we're kind of inheriting, not to refer specifically to the work that you've been doing, but to the, the, these kind of cast, we're sort of cast in certain roles and we have to try to step outside of those roles. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. <coughs> Difficult question. Um, I, I don't know if I would like to crack it so much. Uh, I, I kind of have a different approach here. I think you can't change the architect who are working the way they are. You can't also change the future generation to not evolve the way they will. Uh, it's the synergy that would be the best to me. I think it's not even contradictory. There is a different level of knowledge. Uh, also in architecture, when it comes to actual building project, which I didn't show any, the one we have with Hamia, doesn't really deal with that level of technology. It's a lot of it is about dealing with uh, city planning and a lot of practicality. And then there is a little part of it that comes to design and maybe dealing with the industry and so on and so on. So this is a truth and reality of architecture and construction. It's a very wide, uh, wide field. I also think architects are a bit like an ocean, uh, shallow, but they need to have this wide range of knowledge. Uh, you might find yourself interested in some specific uh, field and be a specialist, uh, but it's impossible to be everything. It's impossible to be a specialist at the same time, be uh, very wide. You need to work in collaboration with others and uh, everyone find their ways and find their how deep they want to go and how wide they want to be. They find it. And, um, and I, I think in future, even architecture offices will probably have computational team they would have um, overall design team maybe, even, even in our studio, not, it, it, of course it's great if everyone could script, but I can promise that if you start scripting, you would also kind of get 
you lose all the, uh, you can't get hold of uh, rules or other things. You just get into this narrow world. Uh, even for myself, I need to break my days or I can't do same things in the same day. I need to do these two days this and the other two days a totally different world. So um, yeah, uh, I, I think it will happen. And uh, what you have here uh, at Ryerson, you've showed me a few things. You are initiating things also here. I think it's a it's it's a good start. You will not have to worry about it uh, how it will be. You just need to kick it. You need to bring technology. You need to bring the practice involved, and bring the students, and it will grow. Uh, I don't think you need to plan it so much. Yeah, that's a great comment. Thank you, Manya. Um, does does anyone else have any comments from the from the floor? We have mics. Anyone? Um, well, listen, I, I, I think that maybe we can end it there. I, re I really appreciate some of the questions that we just got, and I absolutely think that the, my co-panelists have done a fantastic job at combining, a, giving us a look at what they're working on, but also trying to contextualize that within this very difficult context in this really exciting time that we're in. Um, and I, I would end by just saying that, you know, Many of the legacy, in quotes, um, there's two comments I want to make. One, my colleague uh, Jason Dobbin, who was the chair of the, of the TSA up until recently when, when Maria took over, he was very interested when he met with us at the DF said that we would tap the uh, retiring and the older architects for all of their knowledge around this sort of kind of bumpy, crazy world of design and construction that they had so much experience in. And so he was making a call that, you know, you don't forget about the, quote, legacy architects in this case, but you just kind of get them involved with the younger people because they have, what they have is, you know, they sometimes have more time on their hands. By the same token, we're sitting here in a university every day we come in and there's so many students and there's, there's Ryerson's really big with, on undergraduate programs and there's just thousands of undergraduate students and they have a fantastic creative uh, capacity and they're just looking for various ways to kind of collaborate and get, get and, and reach some of the potential that they, that they have. And so I think there's always a pool of these really fantastic young people. And if we can be clever, those of us in the middle, to kind of bring in some of our sort of senior colleagues, and then we can kind of manage some of the, you know, the kind of known current techniques, which I think we're all doing in our own way. Uh, I think you could really get some crazy sparks, you know. Yeah, Mark. My mind is, uh, I have forgotten, is that um, I was in a meeting, an internal meeting, and, and we were deliberating over the principles and variables for designing a certain type of building. And um, the individual in the meeting said to me, once I give you this information, does this mean you're just going to suck my brain dry and then kick me out of the building because you've got everything you need from me? <laughs> And, and I said, well, surely, I said, well, let me put it back to you. Surely that's not everything between your ears, right? <laughs> in, which, in which case, he became a little offended. And, but the point is, is that, is that, um, is that you're right. That, that actually is the connection, is that there is, uh, let alone what the books have to say is one thing, right? But so much of architecture is on site in boots and a helmet that that knowledge is the knowledge that needs to get tapped and embedded in systems so that the systems that you build will teach the young people as they use them what those principles are and so they can effectively see that connection and experience it when they bridge that gap. Thank you so much. That's a really great closing comment. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. I uh, really appreciate the TSA stepping up to join with us to make this uh, forum happen. Thank you to everybody at the DFZ who put in a lot of work to get this thing going and to our, our sponsors. So thank you and good night.